velocities. Uh, other than attributable to the Hubble flow expansion of the universe and also working on accreting black holes at the centers of galaxies. Uh, so she loves cosmology and she loves talking about cosmology. Um, and tonight she's gonna to be speaking to us about dark matter and dark energy. Of course, dark matter is uh, responsible for approximately 85% of the matter in the universe. Dark energy responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe that we've been experiencing for uh, roughly six or seven billion years. And so Rachel, I'll turn it over to you, thanking you for joining us. Hi, uh, I'm always glad to. I, as you said, I, I love talking about it. I love excuses to make other people listen to me talk about it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Is this visible? Yes. Okay, so hi, as it's been said, my name is Rachel Cianetti and thank you for pronouncing it right. Um, that was very impressive. Um, <laughs> So also as been said, I'm a rising junior. So I just finished my sophomore year at the University of Kansas and I am double majoring, um, which is happens to be very convenient at the University of Kansas because all, most of the required classes are the same. So it's it's a little bit of a, a easy double major, but it's, it's great. Um, and I love my department. Um, also, as it's been mentioned, I'm working on two research projects, which I won't go into detail, but if anybody at the end wants to ask about it, um, I'd love to talk about it. Another thing that I love to make people listen to me talk about is research. So, um, but also I want to stress that, um, like, ask questions about anything because I'm an undergrad. I'm new to all these things. Um, I'm not an expert, so I like when people ask questions because I feel like I learn just as much from the questions as you might learn from this presentation. So, um, but today we're going to be talking about dark matter and dark energy, which are sort of two of the big question marks in the study of the universe on a large scale right now. Um, so the exciting thing is that both of these are question marks, they're developing fields. So anyone that's watching this right now, especially if you're a younger person, you could grow up and be a part of solving this problem. Um, but I just wanted to start out with this image because I want us to get into the headspace of thinking about the universe on a really large scale. Um, this obviously isn't a realistic image, but it is supposed to represent the universe as a whole from the filamentary structure you see at the edges, which is how the universe looks if you could see it all at once, um, all the way down to our solar system. So the things we're gonna be talking about are about the universe on really, really big scales or really, really big ideas um, that permeate the whole universe. So. I just wanted to get in that, that fun frame of mind with this picture. I think it's beautiful. So when I said dark matter and dark energy, um, that was in chronological order. So first we're going to talk about dark matter. Um, so dark matter, you may have heard of it. Um, essentially, it's mass or matter that we can't see. Um, if you've ever heard of that, it's sort of a mystery still, but there are things we do know about it and we'll get to those. And we'll also figure out how we know that it's there because that kind of seems like a mystery itself, right? It's invisible stuff, but we know that it has to be there. And that doesn't make sense the first time you hear that. But essentially dark matter is, well, nobody knows yet. We just know that it's there. Dark matter is more of a term for filler, or we know something's there, but we don't know what it is. So we're calling it dark matter because it sounds cool and mysterious. Um, a better name for this would be invisible matter um, because it is invisible to us, not dark, um, but we'll get to that. But let's start off with how we know that it exists. If we can't see it, how do we know that it's there? Well, first let's talk about the opposite, which is stuff that we know it's there because we can see it. That's called luminous mass. Um, so this is the stuff that we're familiar with on the periodic table. Um, it's protons, neutrons, electrons, atoms, elements, things like that. Um, this is called luminous mass or luminous matter because we can see it because it interacts with light, which essentially means that when a light beam hits um, one of these particles, it reflects the light back to our eye. So therefore we can see it there. Whereas if it's invisible, the light goes straight through and you can't see it because it never interacted with that particle. So this is sort of the opposite of dark matter is regular matter that we know about, we see it's around us, etc. But we see the effects of something that isn't luminous. So we know that there's stuff like the stuff around us that we can touch, but it doesn't interact with light. 
And that stuff is dark matter. And once again, it's sort of a term, just a filler for, we don't know quite what's going on yet, but we know that something is amiss. Um, and again, it's a developing field, which makes it, in my opinion, very exciting to talk about. Um, but essentially we see it there because we see the effects that it has as opposed to seeing it directly. But how do we know that? How do we know that it's affecting things? What does that mean? Um, what we can do is we can go over a relatively simple um, three-step process um, for which we have to put both our astronomer and our physicist hats on. Um, and this will lead us to how we sort of discovered um, the existence of dark matter. Um, so there are three steps. The first one is to measure mass by observing how interstellar objects behave or how much mass there is that is affecting how things are acting. And if you don't know what I mean by that, we'll get there. Number two is measure how much mass you see or basically just look at the sky, say there are this many galaxies, they weigh this much, there's that much mass there. Um, so that's more related to the luminous mass that I was talking about, the stuff on the periodic table. And if you're wondering how are these things different, we'll also get to that because you might be thinking, aren't those the same thing? Um, but the issue is that they're not exactly the same. So the third step is once you have these two things, you have the acting mass and the mass that you can see, you see that they're the same amount, essentially. So let's go over these steps, starting with the more confusing one, which is measuring mass based on how things are behaving in space. So let's take a galaxy cluster, for example. If you don't know what a galaxy cluster is, it's essentially a bunch of galaxies buzzing around, sort of like bees in a beehive. Um, and they're buzzing around, but they're all sort of mutually contained in a sphere in a way, um, such that they're buzzing around, but they never buzz further than this sort of limit. And they're all sort of just a contained group of galaxies. Um, so we're going to take a galaxy cluster to take all these measurements, measure the mass that should be in the galaxy cluster based on behavior, measure what we see in the galaxy cluster, and then comparing the three. But how can you measure without just doing step two, without just saying, here's as many galaxies, this is how much they weigh, this is how much weight there is. How can you do something that isn't that process? Well, before we talk about that, let's talk about some basics first. So when I talked about putting our astronomer hat and our physicist hat on, um, right now we're using our, our physicist hat. So the first basic is that when I say mass and matter, those kind of mean different things if you're taking matter to be luminous mass or the stuff on the periodic table. So all matter, all luminous stuff has mass, but not all mass has to have luminous matter or the stuff on the periodic table. Mass is just the quality of having a gravitational pull. So you can see here, imagine this object is like the sun and that surface that you see is spacetime. So it's very massive, so it's creating a sort of divot in space-time. Um, and here you can see that there's that same sort of gravitational well or that divot, but there's not necessarily luminous stuff there. So as close as you can get um, to, a, to a pictorial representation of dark matter, it's this, um, where there's a gravitational well and it's impacting the space-time fabric, but we can't see anything. Basic number two is that mass creates an inward force, um, or basically it creates a well in space-time fabric that other objects follow the curve of. Um, there's a simple example of this. You can think of a bowling ball versus a marble on a trampoline to represent how when you have more mass, you create more inward force. So for example, if you have a bowling ball on a trampoline, it bends the fabric of the trampoline so that if you were to drop some smaller object, it would go in towards the center or towards the high mass bowling ball. Whereas if you were to set something light, like a marble right on the center of the trampoline, provided you could get it to not roll away, it wouldn't create any sort of divot. So if you dropped another small object, it wouldn't go towards the marble because it doesn't have enough mass to create enough inward force or bend that fabric enough to attract other objects. And it's the same with objects in space. Um, so for example, you can see here, the Earth, when we orbit around the sun, it's sort of because we're in this, this region of the sun's gravitational well that keeps us near it. Um, but we don't quite spiral into the sun as you would if you were dropping a small object towards that bowling ball on the trampoline. 
Um, so why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we just spiraling into the sun? Why are we lucky enough to not just spiral into the sun? So that's another basic idea that we need to be familiar with. Um, essentially, motion creates, in this situation, a quote-unquote outward force. So when you're talking about the inward force of gravity from areas of high mass, motion is sort of the opposite. Um, so motion that is not due to the, the infalling into the gravitational well. Um, so think of the, the bowling ball trampoline situation again. If you have the bowling ball in the center of the trampoline and you just gently drop something like a marble, it'll just go straight towards it. But if you roll the marble and give it some initial speed or some initial motion, it'll sort of go in circles for a bit and avoid just falling straight into that high mass object. So it'll sort of be in a de facto orbit for a little bit um, because it was given that initial motion that fights against the inward pull of gravity. Um, so objects that are in orbit around stars, for example, like us, like the Earth, we're sort of in a Goldilocks ratio of having motion, but also being in that gravitational well, so we don't just go flying in the direction that we're going. Um, we stay contained in the system. And the more speed you have, the more opposition to the pull of the inward force of gravity you have. So we learn all of these basic ideas, but you might be wondering, well, we started talking about how to measure the mass of a galaxy cluster and what does that have to do with any of this? Um, so let's get into why these basics apply to how we can measure the mass of the galaxy cluster. An analogy you can think about, because if it isn't obvious at this point, I love analogies, is you can think about a spinning ball on a string. So you have a string and you can think of the string as somewhat relatively weak and you have a ball attached to the, the string and you're spinning it. Um, if you spin the ball too fast or too hard, the string will break um, if it's too weak. And if the string breaks, you say, oh, well, I don't want the string to break. So you replace it with a stronger string. And then you see if that time when you spin it the same speed and with the same force, it breaks that time. Essentially what you can do in this situation is if you want to spin the ball at a certain speed or you know the speed at which the ball will be spinning, you can calculate exactly how strong that string needs to be in order to hold it in as opposed to breaking and having it go flying away. So when you look at these, these green and red arrows of outward force and inward force, um, they should be reminding you of those two other forces, the gravitational force and the force of motion that opposes that. And when we look at a galaxy cluster, um, we're basically doing the same thing. So essentially, as we talked about, galaxies in a galaxy cluster are whizzing around. They're not stationary, they, they have a velocity, they're moving, but they're not moving enough to just explode and stop being a galaxy cluster. They're still contained, um, sort of like bees in a beehive. So we can do this with galaxy clusters in the sense of we can quote unquote calculate how strong the string needs to be or essentially the gravitational force in the cluster. So we can measure galaxy velocities with telescopes. We can look at a galaxy cluster, take some information in and say, okay, the galaxies are moving this fast or in the other situation, the ball is spinning this fast. So then we can say, okay, so the inward force or in this context, the gravitational pull from mass needs to be at least this strong. Otherwise we wouldn't be seeing a galaxy cluster because their motion would have made them fly apart. So we can do this sort of same thing um, computationally using physics and also astronomy because we're measuring the velocities of those galaxies. So now you know very basically how to measure the mass of the cluster without just looking and saying, I see this much stuff, that's how much stuff there is. So you find the outward force based on astronomy and data that you collect. And then you say, okay, the inward force of gravity needs to be this much. And you can sort of translate that into, that means there has to be this much luminous matter. Or if it was all made out of elements on the periodic table, you say, okay, there needs to be this much quote unquote stuff in this galaxy cluster. It needs to weigh this much. So that was the first step. Um, the second step is to do the first thing I was talking about, which seemed like the simpler way, which is just measuring how much stuff you see um, and then sort of adding it all together and saying, okay, this is about this much weight. And this is actually very simple because there is a very fortunate relation between mass and luminosity, um, which essentially means that you can use this graph and get a very good idea of how much mass there is based on how much luminosity you see. 
So you can point your telescope at a galaxy cluster and say, okay, it's about this bright when we look at it. So you go over here, you use the graph and you say, okay, so it weighs about 10 solar masses. And obviously a galaxy cluster would weigh much, much more. Um, but for the sake of just understanding the graph, that's how you use it. And it's a very direct relation from what we know in terms of just talking about luminous matter um, or the stuff on the periodic table. So now we can do this step where we forgo all of the calculations. Um, if that's not your thing, congrats. And we just say, there's this much light in the galaxy cluster. So it should weigh this much. And so now that we've done the first two steps, the final thing to do is to compare the two values we got. Um, intuitively, if there's no crazy invisible stuff in the universe, um, they should be the same. And that's what people expected prior to the discovery of dark matter. But the issue is that they are very, very different values in the sense that the first one is much, much greater than the second one. Or in other words, according to physics, there needs to be a lot more stuff there than we actually just see. Um, so this is what led to the idea of dark matter because we trust physics a lot and we say, okay, um, it is likely that there is some sort of substance there that we can't see for some reason, because um, one of my favorite quotes about astronomy and cosmology is, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. Um, so people looked at this and they thought, okay, there must be something there because physics says so. Um, and it is possible that it is just simply invisible to us, but we don't know what it is or where it's coming from, but we do know that it's about 85% of all the stuff quote unquote in the universe. Whereas the normal matter or the stuff we're familiar with is about 15% of the quote unquote stuff in the universe. So the first observation of dark matter arguably was in the 1930s by Fritz Zwicky. He was a very, a very characteristic gentleman, if you can tell by this picture, he was very interesting. Um, but he essentially measured the Coma cluster, which is a specific galaxy cluster, in the way that we just described. He used the physics aspect, the astronomy aspect, compared the two and realized that they don't match at all. Um, in his case, the mass that needed to be there was 50 times more than the stuff that he saw. And obviously back then, astronomers were much more prone to errors because their equipment wasn't as good, but it was still the right idea. Um, and we've, we've done multiple measurements since then, countless measurements since then that confirm that there is some sort of invisible substance or at least physics invokes the need for one. There are some things that we do know today though about dark matter, which is encouraging. Um, so one of the first things that I want to mention that we know now is that it doesn't just exist in clusters, it also exists in galaxies. Um, so our own Milky Way has a great deal of dark matter and something interesting about it is that it doesn't exist in the disk of our galaxy as the luminous matter does. So when you think about our galaxy, it's sort of flat and it's a spiral, but the dark matter actually exists more in like a spherical shape. Um, and we know this by also invoking physics in terms of the rotation of galaxies. And basically rotation is similar to that motion of galaxies and galaxy clusters. So you can look at how a galaxy is rotating and say, okay, it's rotating this fast. So how much mass needs to be there to hold those rotating objects in? And once again, it's much more that is needed to be there than we see. Um, and we can go more in depth to this physics to figure out that it is sort of in this halo shape as opposed to also just being in the disk. We also know today that dark matter is probably non-baryonic, which is a fancy way of saying that it's probably not made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's not made up of the type of particles that we're familiar with. Um, and a couple of reasons we think this is true, we're very confident that this is true, is that for one, if it was made of baryonic matter, you could argue that it's just in dark regions of space or they're objects that don't give off a lot of light like planets or ice or rocks or something. Um, but the issue is that if that was the case, we would have seen at least something backlit by this point, um, which essentially means that you might not be able to see someone in front of you if the room is pitch black, but you would be able to see their silhouette if you held a flashlight behind them. And there's so many bright objects in space that if it was made of baryonic matter or it interacted with light, 
we might not be able to see it, but we would see its silhouette at some point because there would be so many bright objects behind it. Um, and we also definitely would have seen it because we know that there has to be so much of it everywhere if it were to be baryonic. Um, and another reason we believe that it's not protons, neutrons, and electrons is because there's not enough elements um, to compensate. And what I mean by that is that particle physics, which is out of my pay grade, but I know that at least particle physics is to do with the Big Bang and that particle physics predicted very well after the beginning of the universe, what proportion of all elements there should be in the universe. And we observe that proportion very closely. It was, it was basically confirmed by astronomical observations that particle physics particle physics's predictions about how much of each element there should be, we already see. So if there were to be a bunch more of some other type of baryonic element, that would throw off a lot of other conclusions that have been corroborated by other areas of science. We also know that dark matter is usually agreed upon as being quote unquote cold, um, which is a fancy way of saying that it essentially is less energetic or a little bit more dense than regular matter. Um, this is because it doesn't interact with light. Um, so when you interact with light, little pieces of light carry momentum or energy. Um, and so normal matter sort of derives a bit of energy from its interaction with light. Um, but dark matter, since it doesn't, doesn't interact. Um, it doesn't acquire that momentum, that energy. Um, so it's quote unquote cold um, or less energetic. And in the early universe, um, when everything was very hot and dense and whizzing around, particles were whizzing around, luminous matter was whizzing around, cold dark matter was sort of like the, the chill elder of the universe. Um, the luminous matter particles were sort of acting like children and you know they were all excited and running around everywhere. Cold dark matter was quick to calm down, stop whizzing around and sort of coalesce into a structure. Um, because since it had less energy inherently, again, we hearken back to that opposition between motion energy and gravitational attraction. Since dark matter had less of that motion energy because it wasn't buzzing around, it was easier to gravitationally sort of contract it. Um, so it coalesced onto itself because of gravity and it coalesced everywhere in this sort of structure that now that luminous matter is sort of starting to calm down, it falls into that structure that cold dark matter made that's been there the whole time because it's giving in to those forces of gravity um, because cold dark matter still has mass. It still has that gravitational pull. Um, so the reason dark matter being classified as cold is so important is because it's very important to our universe structure as a whole. When you see this sort of filamentary structure, it's more referring to the structure of dark matter um, and luminous matter in our current time of the universe is slowly starting to fall into suit with the structure and um, match up with it because of gravity. There are some things that we don't know today, obviously about dark matter, namely, what it is. Um, and there are a few options for what it is. And these are, at this point, um, have varying degrees of followers. So one option is primordial, or basically just really small black holes or brown dwarfs. And this falls under the machos category, um, which stands for massive compact halo objects, um, which basically means a bunch of really not light emitting, dark sort of normal objects. Um, brown dwarves being just things that were almost a star but didn't quite get there, so they're pretty dim. And small black holes also fitting into our current theories of what the universe is. They would have mass, but they would be really small. You wouldn't be able to see them really. Um, the issue with this theory is, as I said before, um, if there are brown dwarves, that's invoking baryonic matter. We talked about why that wasn't likely. And with black holes, um, we would also still see them, them backlit. Um, they still have a mass um, impact that bends even light around them. So things like black holes, they have mass um, that not only pulls objects in, but pulls light in. So we would still see it backlit in a way because if light was going behind it, it would sort of bend around its, its area of mass. And so we would see light sort of following this sort of shape. Um, so that's not really favored. In the, in the community, but it is still out there and some people do still subscribe to it. The second option is WIMPs, um, which is funny compared to machos, um, or axions, 
Um, and these are what you think of when you hear dark matter. When you hear dark matter, you might imagine some sort of cool particle that we don't know what it is, but we know it's out there. And that's what this theory is. This theory is that dark matter is a particle that isn't quite like the ones we know and love, but it's similar. It just doesn't interact with light. Um, WIMP specifically stands for, as you can read here, weakly interacting massive particle, which means weakly interacting with light or with um, things that are not like the regular matter that we can see that it's impacting. And the final theory is called MOND. Um, you can see these people are very fond of acronyms. Um, this means modified Newtonian dynamics, which essentially means um, we don't need to invoke any new sort of substance or some sort of object. What we need to do is revise our physics. Um, because as I said, all of this comes from the, the seed of using physics to figure out how much mass needs to be there. And there are a group of people out there that think maybe we don't need some mysterious invisible particle, maybe our physics is just wrong um, and we don't want to admit it. Um, this theory is not immensely popular, but it is more popular than the first one um, comparatively. And there are a lot of people out there who are still arguing for this hypothesis, but mostly the second one is the most popular one. So for that reason, since most people believe that hypothesis, um, there are many, many detectors around the world at this point in time trying to find dark matter. Um, so you can see a map of them here. Um, so these are detectors looking for dark matter, but once again, they're very hard to find because they don't interact with light. Um, so we can't see them. What we're sort of hoping to see in the most basic sense is not an in invisible particle, but we're hoping that by chance it runs into um, a particle that we can see. And this particle will attain some energy from the dark matter particle and then light up because it got some energy and give off a characteristic light signal that we can look at and say, okay, that was derived from a dark matter particle or it's not derived from a particle that we know the behavior of. So that might be dark matter. Um, and a lot of people have basically huge vats of liquid, um, hoping that one of the particles inside that huge vat of liquid will interact with the dark matter particle. That's what um, all of these observatories, I suppose, are. So that's dark matter. That's essentially what we know and what we don't know. But that's only 27% of the universe with another 5% being the luminous matter or the matter that we're familiar with. Um, because when I talked about 85 and 15%, that was just in reference to matter in the universe um, or quote unquote stuff. But there's another 68%. And given the title of this presentation, I'm sure it's not a surprise that it's dark energy. Um, so in the sort of uh, composure of the universe, 68.3-ish percent is dark energy. Um, but you may be thinking that's strange. When you talk about what the universe is made of, you think of stuff, you think of things, whether it's invisible or not, you think of things that you can feel or touch, things like that. So how would the universe be comprised of just energy? Um, and what I like to bring up here is just, I think the only equation in this whole, this whole presentation, hopefully, um, so I don't lose too many people. Um, but it's E equals MC squared. So basically what this means is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So if you're a little thrown off by the idea of the universe being composed of a lot of energy, try to remember that energy and mass in a way are sort of different forms of the same thing um, provided by this equation. But what is dark energy? It's much less understood than dark matter um, for reasons that we'll get to. Um, but you might not have any idea what it is. Um, so first, we just need a little history about the universe's behavior on a large scale, because this is what dark energy is related to. Um, and let's just go over a little history here in that the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, when they were thinking about the universe and whether it was finite or infinite, which means whether it's like a container or it never ends, um, they thought that the universe must be finite, as in contained. This is because they thought that if the universe was infinite, there would be infinite stars in the sky. And when you look up at the sky, you don't see infinite stars. You see some regions of black and you see some things that look like stars that are also galaxies and other awesome things like that. Um, but 
they argued that since you couldn't just see stars everywhere, that the universe must be contained. There must be a finite amount of stars. Isaac Newton, um, who obviously was someone who was an expert in gravity and the idea of gravitational pulls, argued that if the universe was finite or contained, but it was full of stuff that had gravitational attraction to itself, all the stuff inside would just collapse onto itself um, because all of it would just attract itself and there would be nothing fighting against that inward force. So everything would be collapsing. Either we would already be collapsed or we would be witnessing the collapse. And neither of those things seem to be true, thankfully. So Isaac Newton actually argued that the universe has to be infinite to prevent this collapse, because if the universe was infinite, there wouldn't be any one place that the mass would start pulling everything else in. Excuse me. Um, and finally, Albert Einstein, many years later, um, actually sort of agreed with the Greeks in that he thought that the universe was finite and it was contained and it was static. Um, this is important, which means that it wasn't growing, shrinking, it wasn't changing at all. It was just like a container. Um, and the reason that he knew that what the Greeks said wasn't true, though, about infinite stars is that um, the reason we can't see infinite stars is because sometimes when things are farther away, their light dims by the time it tries to get to us. Rachel, um, can you unmute yourself, please? Oh, I didn't know I was muted. I'm sorry. What's the last thing I said? Uh, you, I think you missed about one sentence. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, so essentially, yeah, yeah, Albert Einstein knew that um, the universe is finite, but he also knew that there were um, regions where we weren't seeing the stars in opposition to what the Greeks thought just because of how light dims because of dust and other objects and things like that. But he agreed with them in the sense that he thought the universe was finite. Oops. Um, but what Edwin Hubble realized in 1929 sort of disagreed with all of those conclusions. Um, he agreed that the universe was finite, but Edwin Hubble actually proved, along with important data from these other two scientists, that the universe is expanding or it's getting bigger. It's not static, as Einstein thought. And funny enough, Einstein later went on to call um, his conclusion that the universe was static as his, his biggest mistake, his biggest blunder. Um, but what Edwin Hubble realized, one, is that the universe is expanding. Two, he also realized that the universe is bigger than our galaxy alone. Um, believe it or not, all the way up until 1929, people didn't know that there were other galaxies. They thought that the Milky Way was the whole universe. Um, so Edwin Hubble realized that the universe is a whole lot bigger than we thought it was. Um, and at the time, he actually called other galaxies island universes, um, which I think is cool. And finally, because of this expansion that he discovered, um, it was concluded by him and another scientist named Lemaitre. It's French, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but they both realized that a Big Bang would need to exist um, based on the simple idea that if the universe is expanding, that means that in a year from now, it'll be a little bit bigger. And then a year from then, it'll be a little bit bigger. But if you work backwards in time, that means a year ago, it was smaller. And then a year before that, it was even smaller. And you can keep going back until you inevitably end up at a single point. Um, so this is sort of when the idea of the Big Bang was conceived as well. So all in all, 1929 was a very eventful year for humanity in our view of the cosmos and our place in it and how small our place in it is. But um, how did he realize that the universe is expanding? I mentioned both of these other astronomers because their data was completely essential to how he realized that the universe was expanding. So let's first just go over what they contributed and then we'll talk about how it relates. So first of all, Vesto Slipher, which is a name if you ask me, um, had a data that he collected about redshift, um, which essentially can indicate to us the velocity of an object in space. Um, and this is related to something called a Doppler shift, if you've ever heard of that. Um, so essentially what a Doppler shift is, it applies to any kind of wave, so light waves or sound waves. So a simple example is thinking of when a train is coming towards you and it's, it's blaring its horn, 
Um, it sounds like it's rising in pitch as it's coming towards you. And then it's in front of you. And then as it goes away, the pitch of the horn goes down. Um, and this is visually what's happening to those sound waves. As it's coming towards you, the sound wave is moving towards you as it's being emitted. So it's being sort of crushed. Um, so that increases the frequency or increases the energy of that wave. As it's moving away, it's being emitted, but it's being emitted as it's moving away from you. So it gets stretched out, which makes it less energetic and makes the pitch lower. This applies to light as well. So when light is moving towards you, um, if you think of it just sort of as it is in a neutral state of visible light, if it's moving towards you, its wave is squashed a little bit so it gets more energetic. And this translates to a shift to the blue end of the spectrum because that's the more energetic side of the spectrum. So light that's moving towards you will look a little bluish, whereas the opposite is true with an object that's moving away from you. It will look reddish because it's light waves being stretched out into the, the less energetic end of the visible spectrum. So Vesto Slifer had this data um, about the red shift of objects in space um, and also blue shift if something is moving towards us. And the amount that it's red shifted or blue shifted can indicate not only that it's moving towards or away from us, but how fast it's moving towards or away from us. If it's moving away from us at a very high speed, it's very reddish. Um, but if it's moving away at a slow speed, it's only a little bit reddish. Henrietta Leavitt was able to provide data about distance to objects in space, which is not as easy of a task as you may think. Um, so what she discovered were a type of star called Cepheids, um, Cepheid variable stars, which essentially are stars that get brighter and dimmer on regular intervals. Um, and that um, brightness and dimness, the length of how long it takes for it to go from bright to dim, indicates how bright that star is um, in terms of how absolutely bright it is. Not how bright it looks to us, but how much power it actually is giving out. And if we know the absolute brightness of something, and then we also know how bright it looks to us, that can indicate to us how far away it is. Um, in the same way that if someone's shining a light in your face, you know it's closer because it hurts than if they're shining it from far away. Um, but the whole time the flashlight gives off the same power or the same intrinsic brightness. So she was able to realize that these stars, if you notice them, can tell you about their intrinsic brightness um, by how they're getting brighter and dimmer. Um, so there's this relation that we have here that you can use um, for a period to luminosity. And this is extremely important because we can calculate distance in that way. Um, we can calculate distances further than where we can just use parallax um, because parallax only gets us out to a very short distance in space. So we needed something else to measure distances and she was the one to find it. So she's an, a very important astronomer that is honestly often overlooked. So Edwin Hubble used both these sets of data to realize that there's a linear relationship between velocity and distance. Or in other words, he calculated the distances to things using Henrietta Leavitt's data and then calculated their velocities using the redshift idea. And he realized that something was here, it was moving away from us at a certain speed. Something was further, it was moving away even faster. And if it was further, it was moving away even faster. Um, so it's this linear relationship between distance from us, specifically from our observational point, and the apparent velocity that it has. Um, and it's important that we call this apparent velocity, um, and we'll talk about why. But essentially, this relation between the farther a thing is, the, further, the faster it's moving away from us, um, and it's always moving away, indicated that the universe was expanding. And this might not make sense um, immediately, which is fine. Um, essentially, the reason that this led to an expanding universe conclusion is that that linear relationship is characteristic of if you're inside a medium that is expanding at all points. Um, and I like this analogy, um, it's often used um, of like raisin bread cooking in the oven. So you have, before it's cooked at all, these two raisins, which are five centimeters apart, and these two, which are 10 centimeters. But if the bread increases in size at all points, these are now 10 centimeters apart, and these are now 20 centimeters apart, which means that these two had a change of five centimeters over that amount of time, but these two had a change of 10 centimeters over that amount of time, which means that this one essentially, if we say that this happened in five minutes, it means this has a velocity of five centimeters per five minutes, and this one has a velocity of 10 centimeters per five minutes. So this one 
will look like to this one, if we call this us, that it moved away with a faster speed than this one might. So that relationship holds true for all these raisins. The further away a raisin is, the more it looks like it moved in those five minutes. Therefore, it looks like it has a faster recessional velocity from our vantage point right here as this raisin or this galaxy. So that's what led to the idea of universal expansion. And in 1998, if realizing that the universe was expanding wasn't crazy enough, um, a couple astronomical teams realized sort of at the same time that the universe is expanding, yes, but it's also accelerating. Um, so this is where the idea of dark energy becomes important because if you think about it, the universe expanding would make sense given an initial big bang because it was like an explosion. It had an inherent energy, um, an inherent initial energy. Um, so you might think it would be sort of expanding, but maybe slowing down or think, something like that. Um, but then we realized that the completely counterintuitive thing was true and it's expanding, but it's expanding faster and faster over time. So why does this accelerated expansion lead to the idea of dark energy though? Um, why does it need to be invoked the same way that dark matter needed to be invoked by physics? Um, should the universe be expanding faster and faster? Can that make sense without invoking anything new? Um, remember our rules about mass making an inward pull. As I mentioned, um, when Isaac Newton was thinking about whether the universe was finite or infinite, he said, if the universe was finite and it has a bunch of stuff in it, those things are going to be attracting each other um, or attracting itself inward. So that's what we would expect with the universe. Even if it was expanding, um, that would be leftover energy from the Big Bang, whereas the inward force would be from mass that's always pulling in. Um, so the outward force should be diminishing and the inward force is always there. Um, so it slowly would take it over. Um, so we would expect the universe to slow down, um, but it's not, it's speeding up. Um, so what people thought before is what I just said, where mass is sort of pulling in and even though the universe is expanding, it's gotta slow down because the mass is winning that fight between the two. Um, but now what we know is that there is that inward pull from mass, but the universe is ignoring it. It's deciding to expand at an accelerating rate anyway, no matter what the mass says. So there is something fighting the force of gravity, but we don't know what it is. And that is what we call dark energy. So it's the same as dark matter where the dark makes it sound mysterious and cool, um, but essentially it's a filler word for we have a phenomenon going on that doesn't match up with physics, so we need something to explain it, but we don't know what that thing is yet. And dark energy is even more poorly understood than dark matter, um, especially since we've only needed um, it to exist in the realm of physics since 1998, as I said, when the accelerated expansion was discovered. Um, the leading theory is that it's a, a property of space itself. So that's the reason why it would accelerate over time or increase in its power. Because if it's a property of space and there's this much space, but space expands because of it, well, now you have more space that all has its own amount of dark energy. So it sort of is a feedback loop where the more space you have, the more dark energy you have, which makes the universe expand faster, which gives you more space, which gives you more dark energy, which makes it expand faster. Um, so vague as it is, that's the main theory for what dark energy is. It's just some property of space, um, sort of on the quantum level that we can't quite understand yet. And so that together, dark matter and dark energy are sort of the, the big parts of the leading theory of the universe as a whole. Um, you might've heard people mention the theory of everything. Um, and this is sort of as close as we are right now with the question marks and all. Um, so this is what it's referred to if you ever see this set of letters and symbols. Um, the lambda basically represents dark energy and the CDM represents cold dark matter and matter. Um, so these two things together basically form the basis of our idea of the universe on that really big scale that I was talking about when I brought this picture up. Um, so that's, that's it. That's basically everything we know and everything we don't know, which is a whole lot more than what we know a lot of the time, but that's what makes studying this stuff so exciting. Um, so yeah, um, questions? These are my sources, but.
Uh, <clears throat> I have one, if I may, Rachel. Mm -hmm. First of all, great talk. Thanks. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, you've undoubtedly seen the image of the bullet cluster in Karina, the, uh, with the blue halo that was imaged. I think I might know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm uh, bad it's, with it's, names. It's a, it's a, I wish I could show it. Um, it's an image of a galaxy cluster that supposedly uh, has a detectable blue halo that somehow represents the dark matter. Yeah. I assume that's simply mapped rather than imaged, but I'm just wondering how it was mapped. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Maybe it was just, was it a, a visual representation maybe of the, the concentration of mass that they probably, observed from probably. lensing I mean, or something? Yeah, it looked like a galaxy cluster with two blue lobes on either side of it. Oh, okay. And I assume were mapped on there as a result mm -hmm. of motion detected in the cluster. In, in other words, the anticipated location of it. I was just wondering how that was made, if you knew. Um, I mean, that's a rather specific question. <laughs> that's fine, that's interesting. Um, and a, another thing I wanted to ask, um, the, uh, how have uh, primordial black holes been ruled out as a leading contender for responsibility for dark matter? I know less about that from what I do know. I believe it's just because like, um, based on like theories that we have of sort of what formed in the early universe, there wasn't really ever a parameter that suggested we would have a lot of those. Um, but that's that's almost as much as I know, other than that, if they're considerably large enough, we would have seen lensing as well. I see. Yeah, that that's pretty much it. If, it, if they are there, we should see lensing. And there's also the deuterium limit um, that the Big Bang Theory predicts for the amount of actual normal matter there is in the universe. And there's but, just not enough more normal matter. But we wouldn't see lensing from small primordial black holes. Um, we would see micro lensing. Could you detect? A, could you detect that. lensing from a primordial black hole the size of a baseball? I mean, that would be rather yeah, difficult. Even the distance. Yeah. But we probably could detect it in the halo of our galaxy. As far as I know, it's also just that um, sort of as Matt said, like I, black holes are still still baryonic. So they would still have to be extra baryonic matter that would be accounted for. Um, I, I believe that's why. Yeah, the, the deuterium limit that um, we get from the decay rate of free neutrons is, is the hard limit of how much normal matter there is. And that's really, that's the big limit on machos is it only can make up about 4% of the total mass of the universe mm -hmm. where dark matter makes up 20%. So that's your, that's your big limit that you have to have something exotic making up the majority. I have a question on uh, the, the velocities of the, of the galaxy clusters. Was that empirical, was that measured data? And if so, how do you normalize from you know galaxies that are have a radial component as opposed to just moving apart from each other? Because the Dopplers, if it's measured, the Doppler shifts are going to be inaccurate because of the angle of of uh, of the measurement of the measurer. Yeah, I'm assuming that um, from what I know about uh, sort of like bulk flow or like velocity of like a, a bunch of things at once is that you measure the velocities that you can just sort of along the line of sight and like you get a general idea of some of them that are like you can tell that they're going to be like accurate along the line of sight and then you sort of use those as an average i'm not exactly sure because honestly um i'm much more familiar with theoretical stuff than i am with observational astronomy um, but I, I would guess that that's it, that we just take the, the things that we can acquire along the line of sight, either towards us or away from us, and sort of extrapolate um, some estimates from that, um, just estimates of their, their peculiar velocities as a whole. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
Rachel, you mentioned something about uh, dark matter not interacting with light, but it does interact with space, which would cause light to bend. Has there been any detection of bending of light in the vicinity of clusters that would be attributable not to the cluster itself, the visible cluster? I, I can't think of a specific example, but I believe that I've heard of that, um, just sort of like lensing due to empty looking regions. Mm -hmm. Um, specifically with clusters, I think that's right. Or abnormal lensing in the vicinity of a cluster where the luminous matter wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. count for it all. Yeah. And as far as I know, there are no clusters that don't seem to have a component of, of dark matter. How about detection on Earth? I understood there was some claim to detection in Italy that has been somewhat controversial or they don't think uh -huh. it really occurred. Do you, if, if you heard of any people reporting detections? I have not heard of any that um, are confirmed enough or they're confident enough to say, oh, we found it. Yeah. I believe I've heard of people saying like, we might've found it, but the issue is that there are, there are a lot of other sort of like exotic kind of invisible particles that also create those Cherenkov yeah. signals. So um, I believe the issue that people usually have is they wanna say, oh, it's dark matter, but it's it could very possibly be something else. Um, that we sort of already know exists. I don't think I've heard of any with high confidence, but I could be wrong. So since you're more on the theoretical side, what are your thoughts on dark matter being objects from a higher dimension interacting with ours? Oh, I honestly have no idea. Um, those sort of things I I think are super interesting, but I'm not qualified, to be honest, to examine the validity of those claims. But I can't wait until I get to a point where I know enough about the theoretical math and stuff like that to, to have a good opinion on that. I, I personally, I find myself to be more of a uh, open-minded sort of person in the sense that like, I don't I don't always hear things like that and think like, oh, there's no way. Because a lot of people I've met kind of do, but I'm sort of like, oh, like anything, you know, it's all it's crazy. So like, why not? Yeah, I just remember uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson doing a talk on uh, how something from a higher dimension would look to someone on a lower dimension. Oh, yeah. Almost almost like a ghost, <laughs> like yeah. like like it passes through a plane in a, in a shape. It's, it's crazy, yeah. Other dimensional stuff is crazy. The biggest problem with those theories is if everything important happens on a higher dimensional plane, we can't test it. Yeah, and that's true. Really, that's really one of the major fallbacks of any of the theories proposing dark matter or dark energy for that matter is higher dimensional until you get a theory where there is some quantified effect that we can test they're just they're nice blackboard theories i do know a lot of people will tell you that if you meditate hard enough and align your chakras and have some crystals in front of you you might be able to get to that higher dimension so maybe we need to do that <laughs> any, any other questions Okay, well, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's yeah. been a really great pleasure. And I hope we'll see you again in various league events as well and have you back here sometime as well. Really thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you so much. Good luck with school. Thank, thank you, you, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. It was very good. Tony, have we lost our president? <laughs> no, no, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I had scrolled down. I had all the participants on one side and I had scrolled down to see, uh, we had one, one enter uh, just a few minutes ago. And uh, I would just like to uh, um, let her know that, that this um, presentation will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, within a couple of weeks. So if she missed the entire presentation, that's Hannah. Uh, she can uh, she can view it on the uh, on our YouTube channel. So I'd like to thank everyone. Thank Rachel. 
especially for, for uh, presenting for us tonight. It was very, very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wish you uh, good luck in all your academic endeavors. And uh, are you intending to go into a PhD track? Hopefully, yeah. Great, great. So we'll just watch all of the, uh, all of the papers that come out of your <laughs> uh, program. So um, with that, uh, I, I would also like to say uh, members of the EAS or anyone that wants to join our membership dues are due. Um, so um, if you've gotten a letter, uh, please mail your dues in as, as soon as you can. And if you want to join, uh, just uh, go to our uh, 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 website, uh, print out a, a uh, application and mail it into our treasurer um, and you'll be welcome to the society. So thank you very much. I'm going to end the recording and everyone have a nice week. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.